This is episode 56. This is the business of architecture. Helping architects conquer the world. And here's your host, Enoch Sears. Welcome back, Architects Nation. This is your host, Enoch Bartlett Sears, and this is the show where we talk about running a great architecture firm so that we can do what we set out to do when we started school, which is make the world a better place, do good design. And this show is brought to you by the Business of Architecture Conference, where you'll be able to learn everything you ever wanted to know about starting an architecture firm, marketing a firm, finding more clients. Today, I'm happy to welcome back to the show Lisa Henry. She's a principal of Greenway Group. And she helps architecture firms improve their business performance. So, Lisa, welcome back to the show. Thanks, Enoch. Great to be with you. Now, last week we ended up just kind of on the tail end talking a little bit about firm succession planning. And one thing that comes to mind when I think about this is you have two scenarios. You have sole practitioners who are thinking about winding down their firm or what's going to happen when I retire. And then you have other firms that have other people who are a part of it and there's some sort of ownership transition. Could we talk first about sole practitioners, people who are looking for an exit strategy for their firm? Do you have any any advice or strategies for dealing in, with that kind of scenario? Oh, absolutely. This is this is um, really a business issue that we've been seeing so much more of um, in the last um, several years, and um, the goal of ownership transition is to keep the firm intact. Um, you know, you start a firm and you want to keep it operating smoothly um, uh, in the future. And whether um, and it, whether there's an occasion for change or not, um, such as, you know, somebody retires or, you know, something happens, you, you want the firm to continue on. So, um, you know, the idea of keeping the uh, firm transition planning up front uh, you can't start that early enough. You don't want to wait until it's too late. Uh, so the idea of um, uh, keeping the firm intact um, during an ownership transition is just, uh, I think, the, the first point of the purpose behind a uh, transition plan. There are firms that have just simply waited. There's a firm that we worked with in a um, – it was a second-generation firm. It had three principals. And they, for years, promised to sell their shares to um, to their top employees. Um, but they put it off. They didn't have that conversation. And then the, prince, uh, the key uh, designers who had the client relationship said, we want a reasonable amount of this firm or else we're going to cross over and form our own company. And they had, um, they really created um, um, a lot of turmoil because um, they were going to leave the firm and um, the relationships with the principals were really badly torn. Um, They were not able to put that back together and uh, six months of no low productivity and profitability uh, resulted from this this lack of transition planning. Um, The firm put itself in peril um, because it's they had their key people um, essentially walk out the door, and that's not any place that a firm needs to uh, see itself. If they had started their transition planning a few years earlier, they would never have put themselves in that position. Um, it's really an owner's responsibility to um, to address this. And why do you think it's so difficult or so uncommon to have? a good transition plan in place? Well, I think um, it's all about people. And, you know, current owners of firms just can't bear to let it go. Um, They emotionally want to still be the ones kind of running it. And um, that's like a big one. Um, Another reason why we see transitions fail is the next generation of leadership just simply hasn't been prepared they haven't uh, been given the opportunity to develop their leadership skills, even business management skills. Um, and they don't have um, an understanding of the business aspects of running the firm. You know, for all the great uh, design education we provide students, 
there is not a lot of business education that goes along with that, and that is a real challenge um, for emerging practitioners who really are a lot more independent thinking, and they, they're they more impatient about uh, wanting new responsibility, uh, and for them to have uh, – to have some educational preparation for leadership is it's incumbent upon the leader of the firm to give it to them. Uh, that's that's honestly how I feel about it. Uh, you don't okay, students don't necessarily get the business education, but when they enter into the firm and they um, uh, they aspire to um, stay with the firm if um, if a path of ownership is made open to them. They'll stay, and they will be the ones to take this into the next um, to the next phase. Um, the other reason why a lot of transitions don't work out, Enoch, is the potential people who might be able to take it on, um, who have the leadership skills, just can't afford to buy into the firm uh, because there is a financial commitment that has to be made um, as a firm as the firm is going to transition. And if the firm hasn't been funding this transition over a period of time, these um, younger generation employees just aren't going to have the independent resources to buy the firm. When you say funding it over time, how does that look? What does that mean? Um, funding it over time? Uh, what that means is that there is a... Um, a way that's been identified for um, an employee who's been identified as a leader to buy into the firm over time. For example, um, an owner will say, "I, you know, I, you know, you're one that I want to have a partnership interest in the firm," um, and that will mean you have to pay, you know, X dollars in equity. Um, now, does that have to be written? Um, you know, as a $50,000 check this year? No. It can be written as um, an earnout, um, as a proportion of um, that fee over, over that, a proportion of that equity interest over time so that it becomes manageable for that, um, for that person. Um, it's, it's not complicated. Um, all it does is take time. And if you have someone coming into the firm and you're going to transition it the following year, they just simply aren't going to have enough time to come up with that kind of money. As opposed to a 10-year transition plan, there's plenty of time for that person by virtue of the fact that they're working at the firm to pay into um, the equity position that's been offered to them. So might there be a separate equity fund set aside that just then gets funded from uh, the person's yeah. salary? Yes. Yeah, well, if, depending on how they choose to do it, absolutely. Yes. Okay. And should yeah. that junior person decide to leave the firm, what then happens to the equity stake that oh. they contributed to? <laughs> well, I, there, was, I, there are there are programs in place. Uh, you know, there there. There are ways that it can be structured so that um, that person isn't going to lose equity. Uh, they can. There's a. It depends on how it's structured. There's so many ways these things can be structured, Enoch. But I think simplistically saying um, that there would be um, an agreed upon payout uh, if the person ends up leaving. I'll tell you, if the person ends up leaving, and I know life happens, so they do. But, you know, that's really the failure of um, of this whole model because you don't want the person to leave. The point is, is when you tap someone to be a partner, they really want to stick around. And, you know, this is part of the – this is part of it. At the end of the year, as the profitability of the firm is identified, they're going to get – they get a piece of that. They get a proportion of the profits. And um, you've heard the term golden handcuffs. Eventually, that's really what is built. I mean, the equity is built to the point that that kind of engagement and people wanting to stay because there's a, fin a real financial reason to do so um, exists. Got it. Got it. Yeah, yeah. So when in terms of firm culture and getting someone to stay, what are some things or suggestions that you would give to help that happen, to help what are some things that a firm could do to make sure that, People do stay. 
Um, again, uh, primarily, it, when we're talking about firm leadership, um, having um, um, ownership in the firm is an absolute, uh, that, that is a key. Um, you know, you just can't blame people for wanting to stay with a company or wanting to leave a company if they don't have a piece of it. Um, you know, they're more likely to be more loyal to their own careers in that case. But once they have equity in the firm, they start to transfer that to um, the. They tie their destiny more to the to the firm itself, and that's a real key piece. The other key piece you mentioned was, um, you know, the firm culture. Uh, you know, what is the firm culture? Is it inclusive? Um, is it open and accepting of that of new leadership? Or is the firm a command and control, you know, run by one person? Uh, I think those firms are going to have more and more difficulty. Um, if, it's, if a firm is identified with one individual, uh, having that firm be able to transition effectively is going to be more of a challenge. There are myriad of examples of some fantastic design firms that um, literally close their doors because the firm uh, structure and the firm itself reputation is tied up with one person. Uh, you know, and that may be fine for that one person, but once that person makes a decision to retire or leave or something worse, that's the end of the firm. And I don't know why, but to me that's just a real, that's too bad. <laughs> I just think that's a, that's terrible if that is allowed to happen. I mean, because some of these firms have dynamic project work under their belt, great reputations, and that it all resides with one uh, principal. That's that's tough. That's that's tough. And there's no need for it, I don't think. But again, this is a question of firm culture, and if that's how the firm operates, um, that where it does in fact reside within one guy or one person, then you can you can see that um, there's a real difference in uh, the firm culture as a result of that. Yes, let's talk about sole practitioners for a moment, if we may, Lisa. And say there's a, a sole practitioner who's, or say there's, it's either sole practitioner or there's not, there's no bench, there's no lineup in terms of leadership at the firm. It's a smaller firm. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. let's say this this particular firm or person is about 10 to 5 years away from when they want to retire what are the things that they need to be thinking about right now so that they're not crunched up against that deadline without anyone to pass the torch to? Uh, well, they need to be thinking about who um, and how they could open it up so that they are able to identify um, individuals. You know, ideally, transitions can occur from the inside, but... You know, firms also uh, transition to uh, people on the outside. They they end up being sold. Um, but a firm that is looking to um, a sole practitioner who wants to keep the life of the firm going needs to consider um, how he's going to prepare. And 10 years is great. Five years is, you know, it's not as great, but it can certainly be done in five years. And preparing uh, one's successor is part of an owner's leadership responsibility. If they do have talented people working for them, they need to identify what are those skill sets that those individuals have, um, create some kind of a transition plan, a leadership development plan with that person and expressly articulate that to that person so it isn't um, – so that it's not a mystery, that they know that they're on that track. Um, and the owner, so practitioner needs to not look, they, they don't necessarily have to look at people who have the exact same skill sets as they do. There are a lot of new leaders that may be at the firm that have uh, great skills. They might not duplicate the current owner skills, but they do have strengths around um, professional practice in marketing particularly, and that person might just be tapped for um, for a 
potential transition role um, because they do have uh, skills that complement the rest of the team, um, complement the owner, but they're not uh, necessarily duplicating um, the owner's um, the owner's skills. Okay. It really is, yeah, yeah. It, it's just keeping your finger on the pulse of the people that have um, that work for you. Okay. Well, just speaking about the sole practitioners, I'm seeing based upon what you just said, I'm seeing two alternatives. The first one, they have they've set aside money for retirement, and they go into retirement and they earn money off their retirement. Maybe they do some projects here and there to to pay the bills. And the other oh, yeah. one is they. At you know, ten years out, they start looking for a talented person with leadership potential and try to get them into a position to to carry on the firm. Correct. Now, it, with that second scenario, what are some ways of structuring that in terms of buyout? And let's let's give our listeners some specifics here in terms of some some ideas of how you've seen this work. You know, how how is how can a buyout be structured fairly, and what kind of revenue can a retiring principal expect? Hmm. Um, okay. When when a firm is has identified an owner has identified uh, a potential uh, uh, leadership partner uh, that's coming up, you know, the next generation leader, uh, they really need to set up the financial issues in terms of um, you know really making it uh, realistic that. They set small increments for that person to buy in over time. You know, it would be uh, behoove them not to wait until the last moment and then, you know, come up with a big number that is just not going to be possible. So that's why that early planning becomes a real key element in that because you can set the increments, the financial increments, small enough um, to make it um, realistic. And they... um, they absolutely need to get payment directly. They can't give it away. That just is not going to get the – and this is all about skin in the game, Enoch, and, and having people engaged. Um, you know, they say give it away. It just isn't valued, and that's that's just really true. Um, and then, you know, having, um, you know, some way of valuing the firm really does become uh, part of the conversation and most uh, owners have you know, place a value on a firm that you know maybe you know they're they're proud of it. They it might be unrealistic about the value, but you've got to be um, looking at how the firm is going to be valued, making it realistic, and um, keeping the sale of the firm um, and its valuation as simple as possible. Um, a lot of firms use book value, um, which is basically coming right off of their balance sheet. Um, and this is uh, these are the financial steps that um, that need to be taken. Um, they need to, you know, time increments over time for, um, you know, they need to set their increments over time small enough so that people can their designated leaders can plug into this process. Um, and they need to have a price established for those increments, and um, and keep it keep it keep it very simple. Okay, Lisa, I'd like to transition over and talk about a uh, uh, subject that you're passionate about, which is using design to change the world for the better, and how architects can apply this to their work. Can you tell me a little bit about your thoughts on how design can actually impact the world? Yes, of course, and uh, you know I would love to, and and I think that in our all of our hearts as designers, we all know we all know this. Um, we all know the power of design uh, to transform communities, to transform lives. Um, a, it was Winston Churchill who is a guy that I read. I just love historical figures, and Winston Churchill said. Um, first we shape our buildings and then they shape us. And I think that um, it, it is just so true. The, the effect that the built environment has on people is, it just cannot be overstated. Um, buildings are um, the evidence of our culture. They are what is um, what we leave behind in um, informing next generations of what we value 
what is important to us and why is is expressed in the buildings um, that that we build. Um, and designers as leaders um, demonstrate the value that good design can have on uh, the human experience, and we know that we're not only designers of environments, but we're designers of situations. We're des- we design organizations and, and relationships, and uh, the design professions, I believe, will increasingly be the headlines of the future because it's such a powerful um, – it determines human behavior. And um, businesses, I believe, need to have more design perspective brought into their organizations. Um, unfortunately, leadership is something that is um, – it's not built into the uh, education of designers, whether it's explicitly stated or whether it's felt uh, intuitively I think we've all been in situations that we've seen design as uh, a profession that's dominated by its clientele. Um, Unlike a lot of professions like medicine, like attorneys um, and academics, designers tend to do what our fee-paying clients tell us to do. Um, And this this is pretty widespread. What's the alternative, Lisa? Uh, the alternative is that um, our profet well the, the problem statement is is that as a profession, not seeing oneself as a leader has consequences. So um, the alternative is to develop uh, leadership uh, as uh, as a profession, as individuals within the profession. And, um, and hone the, those leadership skills. Um, we need to find ourselves um, recognizing that the preparation as a designer poises us for leadership. We're already good at um, seeing things in context, and we're already conversant in arts and sciences and humanities. We already see um, that um, that environmental awareness and uh, it is critical to the to the process of building buildings and has a consequence um, in the future of, of the planet um, designers understand stand the limits of technology this is a an issue that we're poised to be leaders we just have to take our place as leaders in the community and, and take our place as leaders in businesses and I don't mean just um, just designing um, on a drawing board, but we have to just get more involved in uh, helping to lead companies and helping to direct our clients to uh, solutions um, and stand by them. And what is what does that look like? How can architects be leaders and take leadership roles? Um, again, uh, being part of uh, community leadership programs, being part of generating policies, um, not only within one's community, but on a national level. Um, Policies that are related to, uh, you know, anything having to do with health and safety, of course, is, you know, we need to be in all conversations around health and safety. Um, There is, there is, the professions in our country that are really impacting, um, that are really driving um, agendas on a global scale are professions that are developing policy. And architecture certainly has a voice in that. Um, design professionals need to uh, really be present and accounted for in policy discussions um, in their local community. Um, and to understand that um, in the development, the real estate development process, uh, they are not just responding to what the developers want. They need to be in the conversation to impact um, what what is being delivered to communities that communities are going to be living with uh, for the next hundred and more years. Um, so I think stepping up into and making oneself um, 
uh, a part of um, just the, your local community um, policy discussions. Um, zoning, uh, certainly, that's a, you know, that's huge. Um, um, being part of um, conversations around um, the built environment impact on climate change. Um, these are areas where the design profession has such a role and responsibility and point of view um, to take this into um, um, it, it, it just part of the duty of being a, an, a design professional. I think it's really important aspect of um, being recognized as, um, as, as a leader. Lisa, hopefully we've inspired some of our listeners to uh, take leadership roles in whatever way that, that they feel is they're driven towards. So thank you for that. Well, I, I hope so. I think this is, um, this is, this is something that is um, important to me, and I would really like to see um, uh, designers' judgment not be subordinated or de uh, determined by um, wishes of, um, of, of, of a client who might not be as informed as, as the designer themselves. Well, and I know a lot of architects feel that because the clients hold the purse strings, that their their job and their duty is to do exactly what the client wants. Hmm. Yeah, that's a problem, um, but that really isn't the case. Um, that really isn't the case, and I would challenge um, I would challenge a designer to um, to resist that and to. And that's a wrap for another show about the business of architecture. To get more resources about how you, as an architect, can run a rewarding business that is both fun, flexible, and profitable, visit businessofarchitecture.com and click the Join button to claim your free account to Business of Architecture Insider. As a member, you'll have access to free tools and resources to help you get more clients, start a new firm, and much more. You'll also get access to my book, Social Media for Architects, where you'll learn how to use Internet tools for fun and for profit. Until next week, this has been The Business of Architecture. The views expressed on the show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment, except to help you conquer the world. Bump music credit to Ben Folds 5, Do It Anyway.